From now onwards, we turn our attention to changes in output per capita in much shorter periods of time, say around six years. We call these changes business cycles. In fact, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, the official entity that dates business cycles in the US, the average duration of a business cycle is precisely 5.8 years. In order to do so, we'll think of real GDP to be the sum of two components, a long-run trend that we studied before in the economic growth section, and a cyclical component that revolves around this trend. In this figure, you can see Eurozone real GDP from 1991 to 2015 at 2005 prices. There are statistical methods that are typically used to separate long-run trends of real GDP from short-term fluctuations. Here depicted is such a decomposition. If we subtract from the observed series the computed trend, we are left with a short-term cyclical component here depicted, expressed in percentage deviations from the trend we said in the figure before. This will be the subject of our analysis from now onwards. On one hand, we will try to understand the properties of these fluctuations and possible mechanisms to explain them. On the other hand, how can monetary and fiscal policy act and in which ways to affect real activity? But first, let's characterize what a typical business cycle looks like. We start by noting that consumption follows GDP very closely. Correlation is around 0.94 for the data in this figure but consumption tends to be smoother. This is a very important property, as it is the basis for our consumer behavior theory that is at the core of all macroeconomic models today. But more on that later. Investment is another variable that also exhibits strong cyclical behavior. It also correlates positively with GDP, but is much more volatile. Real wages are also cyclical, but exhibit much less variability. In the figure shown, the correlation is positive but somehow weak, just about 0.13. To this contributes the fact that the events leading up to and following the Great Recession, wages didn't move much. One should be careful into reading too much into this, because the Great Recession was indeed something very different from the average boom recession cyclical behavior that the economy tends to exhibit regularly, and that is the focus of our analysis. Finally, Note also that the rental price of capital is also very cyclical, with a very high correlation, about 0.92, with GDP. Later on, we will focus on theories that can help us make sense of all these empirical regularities. But before that, we will look more closely into the events of the Great Recession. To understand the whole Great Recession dynamics, we will look into a video by Jonathan Jarvis, who did a great job at synthesizing all the complex dynamics into a chain of relatively simple events. The Crisis of Credit, visualized. What is the credit crisis? It's a worldwide financial fiasco involving terms you've probably heard like subprime mortgages, collateralized debt obligations, frozen credit markets, and credit default swaps. Who's affected? Everyone. How did it happen? Here's how. The credit crisis brings two groups of people together, homeowners and investors. Homeowners represent their mortgages, and investors represent their money. These mortgages represent houses, and this money represents large institutions like pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign funds, mutual funds, etc. These groups are brought together through the financial system, a bunch of banks and brokers commonly known as Wall Street. While it may not seem like it, these banks on Wall Street are closely connected to these houses on Main Street. To understand how, let's start at the beginning. Years ago, the investors are sitting on their pile of money, looking for a good investment to turn into more money. Traditionally, they go to the U.S. Federal Reserve, where they buy treasury bills, believed to be the safest investment. But, in the wake of the dot-com bust in September 11th, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan lowers interest rates to only 1% to keep the economy strong. 1% is a very low return on investment, so the investors say, no thanks. On the flip side, this means banks on Wall Street can borrow from the Fed for only 1%. 
Add to that general surpluses from Japan, China, and the Middle East, and there's an abundance of cheap credit. This makes borrowing money easy for banks and causes them to go crazy with leverage. Leverage is borrowing money to amplify the outcome of a deal. Here's how it works. In a normal deal, someone with $10,000 buys a box for $10,000. He then sells it to someone else for $11,000. for a $1,000 profit, a good deal. But using leverage, someone with $10,000 would go borrow $990,000 more dollars, giving him $1 million in hand. Then he goes and buys 100 boxes with his $1 million and sells them to someone else for $1,100,000. Then he pays back his $990,000 plus $10,000 in interest. And after his initial $10,000, he's left with a $90,000 profit versus the other guy's $1,000. Leverage turns good deals into great deals. This is a major way banks make their money. So Wall Street takes out a ton of credit makes great deals and grows tremendously rich and then pays it back. The investors see this and want a piece of the action and this gives Wall Street an idea. They can connect the investors to the homeowners through mortgages. Here's how it works. A family wants a house so they save for a down payment and contact a mortgage broker. The mortgage broker connects the family to a lender who gives them a mortgage. The broker makes a nice commission. The family buys a house and becomes homeowners. This is great for them because housing prices have been rising practically forever. Everything works out nicely. One day, the lender gets a call from an investment banker who wants to buy the mortgage. The lender sells it to him for a very nice fee. The investment banker then borrows millions of dollars and buys thousands more mortgages and puts them into a nice little box. This means that every month he gets the payments from the homeowners of all the mortgages in the box. Then he sicks his banker wizards on it to work their financial magic, which is basically cutting it into three slices. Safe, okay, and risky. They pack the slices back up in the box and call it a collateralized debt obligation, or CDO. A CDO works like three cascading trays. As money comes in, the top tray fills first, then spills over into the middle and whatever is left into the bottom. The money comes from homeowners paying off their mortgages. If some owners don't pay and default on their mortgage, less money comes in and the bottom tray may not get filled. This makes the bottom tray riskier and the top tray safer. To compensate for the higher risk, the bottom tray receives a higher rate of return while the top receives a lower but still nice return. To make the top even safer, banks will insure it for a small fee called a credit default swap. The banks do all of this work so that credit rating agencies will stamp the top slice as a safe, triple-A rated investment, the highest, safest rating there is. The OK slice is triple-B, still pretty good, and they don't bother to rate the risky slice. Because of the triple-A rating, the investment banker can sell the safe slice to the investors who only want safe investments. He sells the OK slice to other bankers, and the risky slices to hedge funds and other risk takers. The investment banker makes millions. He then repays his loans. Finally, the investors have found a good investment for their money, much better than the 1% treasury bills. They're so pleased they want more CDO slices. So the investment banker calls up the lender, wanting more mortgages. The lender calls up the broker for more homeowners, but the broker can't find anyone. Everyone that qualifies for a mortgage already has one. 
but they have an idea. When homeowners default on their mortgage, the lender gets the house, and houses are always increasing in value. Since they're covered if the homeowners default, lenders can start adding risk to new mortgages, not requiring down payments, no proof of income, no documents at all. And that's exactly what they did. So instead of lending to responsible homeowners, called prime mortgages, they started to get some that were, well, less responsible. These are subprime mortgages. This is the turning point. So, just like always, the mortgage broker connects the family with a lender and a mortgage, making his commission. The family buys a big house. The lender sells the mortgage to the investment banker, who turns it into a CDO and sells slices to the investors and others. This actually works out nicely for everyone and makes them all rich. No one was worried because as soon as they sold the mortgage to the next guy, it was his problem. If the homeowners were to default, they didn't care. They were selling off their risk to the next guy and making millions, like playing hot potato with a time bomb. Not surprisingly, the homeowners default on their mortgage, which at this moment is owned by the banker. This means he forecloses and one of his monthly payments turns into a house. No big deal. He puts it up for sale. But more and more of his monthly payments turn into houses. Now there are so many houses for sale on the market, creating more supply than there is demand, and housing prices aren't rising anymore. In fact, they plummet. This creates an interesting problem for homeowners still paying their mortgages. As all the houses in their neighborhood go up for sale, the value of their house goes down, and they start to wonder why they're paying back their $300,000 mortgage when the house is now worth only $90,000. They decide that it doesn't make sense to continue paying, even though they can afford to, and they walk away from their house. Default rates sweep the country, and prices plummet. Now the investment banker is basically holding a box full of worthless houses. He calls up his buddy the investor to sell his CDO, but the investor isn't stupid and says, no thanks. He knows that the stream of money isn't even a dribble anymore. The banker tries to sell to everyone, but nobody wants to buy his bomb. He's freaking out because he borrowed millions, sometimes billions of dollars to buy this bomb, and he can't pay it back. Whatever he tries, he can't get rid of it. But he's not the only one. The investors have already bought thousands of these bombs. The lender calls up trying to sell his mortgage, but the banker won't buy it, and the broker is out of work. The whole financial system is frozen, and things get dark. everybody starts going bankrupt. But that's not all. The investor calls up the homeowner and tells him that his investments are worthless. And you can begin to see how the crisis flows in a cycle. Welcome to the crisis of credit. Thank you, Jonathan, for the great exposition on the crisis of credit. With economies in shambles, governments had to run to the rescue. As we can see, now focusing on Europe, bank bailouts amounted to trillions of dollars of taxpayer money in support. As a consequence, capital markets, who somehow believed that with the euro, the risk of buying German debt was comparable to that of Portugal or Greece, start to question of whether governments would be able to make good on that extra debt and started to demand higher compensations for their loans. This led to massive increases in debt burdens for countries like Portugal, Ireland and Greece, which, like in a vicious cycle, further fragilized the fiscal sustainability of their government's debt and fueled even higher demands in terms of interest to compensate for the risk of lending them money. 
This led to the sovereign debt crisis, where some countries like Portugal had to apply for rescue packages from the International Monetary Fund, which then, together with the European Commission and the European Central Bank, pushed hard in terms of structural reforms that could bring back government debt dynamics to more sustainable paths. Note that by 2012, debt-to-GDP ratios were very high, with these ratios reaching 150 in Greece, 126 in Italy, and 117 in Portugal. We are not going to argue on basis of theory for what is the optimal level of debt for each country. But one should note that more debt today represents more taxes tomorrow. In particular, the interest paid on debt represents the price paid for anticipating those revenues. In 2012, the interest paid on debt alone was so high in Portugal that amounted closely to what the government spent on the whole national healthcare or education systems. High debt burdens represent challenges for current budgets, and it is good to remember what are the consequences that an inability to roll over debt because credit markets lost confidence on a government's ability to repay are. In August 2014, the Greek Health Department cuts its cancer screening prevention program, imposing an upper limit on the number of exams for uterus, breast and prostate cancers that doctors can prescribe, and placing caps on spending on these exams per physicians as part of the fiscal consolidation measures that were adopted. In Portugal, revolutionary treatments for hepatitis C were being held back by the government because of austerity measures, despite that the fact that they were actually a net fiscal gain in the long run. This medicine could cure chronic patients that costed hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to the national healthcare system, plus social security costs. But the lack of liquidity due to the crisis was an obstacle, even to adopt health policies that were fiscally sound and improved everyone's welfare. The crisis threatened to spread to other economies, and in March 2012, Mari Draghi, having been recently appointed as the head of the European Central Bank, had a famous speech where he vowed to do whatever it would take in order to save the euro, in what was perceived by the markets as firm support in contributing to the fiscal sustainability of several countries, leading to lower interest rates. By August, the first formal mechanism of support was introduced, the outright monetary transactions, and a few months later, sovereign debt spreads were much lower. It is worth noting that these outright monetary transactions were never used. Just the fact that they were announced sufficed to collapse a lot of uncertainty in the markets and contributed to raise confidence in sovereign debt, ending the acute phase of the crisis and setting the scene for the recovery. By 2013, economies that had suffered substantially from the crisis were already starting on their path to recovery. And three years later, most of them were already close to pre-crisis levels in terms of GDP, with the exception of Italy and Greece. 